Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment, information, and educational programming on the internet. Audible sells digital audiobooks, radio and TV programs, and audio versions of magazines and newspapers. To start using Audible today, please visit their website at www.audible.com. That's www.audible.com. Welcome to another episode of Taking You to the Top. In this podcast, Rami spends time speaking with founders and CEOs from across the globe and asks them specific questions to learn exactly how they launched their businesses. Before we get started with today's guest, please follow Rami's Instagram account and subscribe to his YouTube channel so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. If you'd like to watch previous episodes, simply click on Rami's IGTV section or visit the YouTube channel to watch those episodes. If you'd like to get more information and analytics about each guest, simply click on the website link in Rami's bio. Now, let me spend a moment to introduce today's guest before Rami gets started. Today's guest is the CEO of Moser Watches. Moser Watches as a brand is known for its tagline as the very rare watch company. It was founded in 1828 and the Malin family took over the helm in 2012. Join Rami in welcoming him to the show. If you have any questions for our guest today, please leave them in the comments section below. That being said, we hope you enjoy today's episode. Without further ado, are you ready to take it to the top? Okay, Edward, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. This is episode number six of Taking You to the Top. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. So, I mean, to get started, if you could introduce yourself, tell us more about you or take us back to the beginning so we can understand the, the history, sort of how, what led you to becoming the CEO of your company. Sure. Um, so I, I am Swiss. I grew up in the, um, the Swiss valleys where um, you have a lot of the big watch brands. Um, actually, I'm the fifth generation uh, working in the, in the watch industry. My father was running uh, Haute Marc Piguet for about 20 years, so he's been leading one of the, uh, the transformation of one of the biggest brands today uh, and led it into what it is today. Um, I have, as a, as a background, I'm an engineer in micro technology. I did the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. I worked uh, in consulting for a few years here in Zurich. Um, then I moved, my first step into the watch industry was to move into Southeast Asia, where I led a um, distribution company of independent brands. With a few brands there that we were uh, distributing in different uh, countries around Asia. And I was taking care of uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And there were offices there and it was a great experience. But as an engineer, I felt, you know, um, my my understanding of uh, finance, marketing, all those aspects, accounting was not at the top. And uh, after a few years, I decided to do an MBA. So I went to uh, Wharton in Philadelphia to do an MBA. Um, I graduated uh, over 10 years ago, 12 years ago. On my way back, um, I joined forces with uh, two other French entrepreneurs. We decided to, uh, to set up a company called Celsius 1062. It was, um, the idea was to develop mobile phones, high-end mobile phones with mechanical elements, a lot of patents about energy gathering for the user using the technology. Um, we were backed by um, VCs. The main one was uh, Sophie Nova Partners from, from France, one of the biggest um, venture capital fund in Europe. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it didn't work uh, that well. I, I left in 2012 when my family and I acquired H. Moser and Company. And um, at that time, Celsius was doing okay, but not great. So having an investment in uh, H. Moser, taking the, the majority stake in there was uh, for us as a family, as an as a, you know, independent uh, watchmaking family, a big investment, a big risk. And um, it was on the German part of Switzerland. We need, it, it's a very product-driven, uh, production-driven uh, uh, company. So we felt uh, somebody with an engineering background, a feeling for product, and speaking both French and German um, was, was important. And uh, of course, being in the family, that helped me get, uh, get the job. And then uh, 
and then the challenge was to prove that the, that decision was not the was the right one and not the wrong one. Right, for sure. Uh, just out of curiosity, in Southeast Asia, did you work in Hong Kong at all? Since you were very close by. No, uh, the the headquarters were in there in was in Hong Kong, so I was there on a regular basis. But uh, my my uh, my countries uh, was in charge um, of uh, Hong Kong was not part of it. There were other people. But my brother lived in in Hong Kong for many years. He actually established. I mean, today we work together. He established um, our distri distribution company in Hong Kong. So we have one in Hong Kong that he established about seven eight years ago. And now he's based in Dubai, where he established um, an office to take care of um, of uh, the Middle East for uh, for Moza. So he was my neighbor then, and he's my neighbor now. I mean, exactly. <laughs> Great. So I want to jump in now into the company itself to get, to get an idea of size, or let's say when, you, when your family acquired the company, yep. was the investment sort of raised capital with other people, or is it fully self-funded by the family? It's more complex than that. Actually, there were there was, I would say, probably a hundred different uh, owners at the time when we came into the picture. But Moser was facing really, really big challenges, financial uh, challenges. There was one big family, um, Swiss uh, billionaires, um, the, the Straumann family, who owned a significant stake, but many small ones. And basically, the choice was to go bust or to find somebody to take everything over when we came in um some of the big groups were looking at it but moser was too small too much work for the big groups to invest into that so it was only people in our size and there are not many who could uh, afford it who had the passion for it uh who could do it so basically we um we came in and said listen it's a tough job we made first a recommendation of what they should do themselves not us being involved say this is after a, a rough due diligence uh, we told them and they didn't like it the way we, we, we presented they said this is what you need to fix and we didn't hear for about a couple of months and then they came back and said would you would you help us to fix it and we said yeah we could but then we want the majority so then there was a discussion <laughs> sure. and the, the Straumann family uh, stayed with us in there the, the uh, very small minority shareholder and uh, and we took over the the majority of the of the business, including the the debts and the challenge of restructuring it, meaning uh, also reducing the number of people, etc., and slowly rebuilding. So, are they still currently on board as a minority shareholder, or they are, and they and they're very happy with, <laughs> with the current results. Perfect. So, uh, talking about size, uh, what's the team size currently? Would you say so when we took over. Yeah, just to give you an, an idea also of how it went. When, when, I, when we took over, we had over 80 people in the office okay. in, um, in Schaffhausen. We kept down the first year to, I think we were below 40. And now we're back to about 65. Interestingly, we produce today three times more, or even maybe, well, maybe this year, three times more. We would, we're expecting to reach almost four times more watches than we were used to with 80 people. So we've become way more efficient. Um, so with 65 people, we can produce three, probably four times more if it was a normal year uh, watches than we used to with, uh, with uh, 30, 40 percent more people. This is exactly what we've witnessed here. The number for us was four. We found that yeah. uh, for every four people that were released, one person could handle those four yeah. people's job. So, yeah, I'm not surprised at all. Definitely. Okay, so um, currently, do you use for growth any specific marketing channels or what would you say is your top marketing channel to get the I mean, name of, to, or the to, brand out there? Was, I mean, we're in full digitalization uh, phase. I mean, we've been very digital, but I would say in a very um, an organized way for the last few years, creating content and going on different channels. Nothing was linked to each other. A lot of people said there was a bit of a of a, I mean, a, a misconception of what the, the way people would perceive the brands through social media, but then going on the digital platform like the website or, or others and, and couldn't really make the link. So that's something we've been working very hard on. Uh, we have a new platform coming on the 26th of August, um, which is completely new for, for us, optimized for everything from SEO to um, all campaigns that we want to, um, to, to do in the future. Today, we are uh, constantly running 
um, um, campaigns, purely digital camp campaigns to bring people to our uh, website, to our shop. We actually have a lot of visitors from the Saudi Arabia. We were discussing it recently and saying, why are there so many people coming from Saudi Arabia and asking questions and, and even buying watches uh, online. And um, that's very interesting because we are not, we're extremely precise in the way we allocate budgets and saying, okay, this is the product we want to push at the moment. Yeah. Uh, these are the three, four markets where we put money. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm surprised how efficient that is. And especially in a period like, like now, I mean, some, it's the first time where I can really say, if I put X, then I, the return is going to be Y. And yes, then if yes, I yes. increase this X, then Y might increase also proportionally. Increase. Yeah. And that's, that's very satisfying because for once, I feel I'm controlling a little bit marketing, whereas usually you don't control. You just throw things and you hope something's going to work. You know? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it's, we're coming, it's moving from art to a little bit of science. And I'm, as an engineer, I like you know, science, science, Cartesian thing. So it's, it's pretty good. Would you say you have like a, a top one that's working best for you right now, whether it be like Facebook advertising or Google pay-per-click? Anything. It's, it's a mix. We, we use all of this. Uh, what's interesting for us is really um, what we call embasement. So get as much data as possible and then feed the people again with, through our newsletters, through uh, targeted advertising again. Um, because I think once people have, I mean, we say usually for a brand to, um, from a person to, um, to really trigger a purchase uh, interest, you need to be touched about seven times by a brand. With our budgets, that's very difficult. So we need to find a way to not reach too many people, but as much as possible, interesting people. So it's really about finding the right audience. And then why, once your algorithm understand really who your target is, who, they, who really appreciate what you do and understand, then try to feed them with more interesting uh, uh, elements. And that's where things like even our newsletter uh, is, is so important on a monthly basis, bring something new, new content, and not just like, oh, look at our new product. No, it's about who we are, who are the people behind, what do we believe in, a lot of different topics, but which are part of the, 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 the brand and, um, and slowly bring this emotion because for us, it's not, I mean, of course, you're happy when somebody sees the, the product say, oh, I want it. I don't know the brand, but I love it. I buy it. But I think it's, it's, it has to be part of a process. And that's more like an accident. What happens usually is people get a, uh, to know the brand, to understand, to appreciate, to get a feeling. And eventually they say, oh, okay, now I'm ready for a model watch. And, um, and we need to have this, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the ability to wait to come before there's this conversion. Just... Uh... I had I had a question that I keep I see the element on your website on on your social media that mentions very rare. It seems to be like a theme that goes through the through the site. Is that related to something specifically or internally that? Well, you it's wouldn't see? I mean very rare. I see it as the cornerstone of everything we do. I mean we do very special products if you look at them they're very different from what other brands would do um, we have an approach very minimalistic when others tend to go into more showing complexity the way we communicate we have a very rare language we have a very rare way of expressing ourselves it's very rare to use humor in communication to use provocation in an industry as traditional as ours the way we use colors the way we use material is quite rare um, the fact that we are family owned and run is very rare. The fact that we integrated to the point where we produce hairspring. So very like the, the, the single that, little yeah. elements in the watch. There's only five companies in the world and the others are, are some of the biggest groups. So that's very rare as well. So I think this is when people ask me what, I mean, how do you summarize Moser? I mean, that's for me, one of the elements to say Moser is very rare. And it's not just about the quantity. It's our philosophy. No, I completely agree. I mean, when I look at your watches, very unique. I haven't seen something like that in the recent Thank you. past. So if you don't mind, uh, we'll wrap up with the famous five. Yeah. So number one, uh, what's your favorite business book? There's one book, I mean, I have it here. But it's, that's the French version. It's called Lux Oblige. I think it's luxury in, um, in, uh, in English. Uh, it's a book that was written by um, two gentlemen. One was running Louis Vuitton for many years, and the other one is a professor from um, in, uh, economy in, um, in HEC in Paris. And I actually contacted him a few years back, and we met on a regular basis. 
And uh, it's really, a, a, what's interesting is really taking you through the process of building a brand and how building a brand in luxury is completely different from building a brand in fast moving consumer goods and how you could take any rules that you would use in fast moving consumer goods and take the opposite for luxury. And uh, that's a book that I actually give to, um, to most of the new employees at Mozo and say, you have to read it if you want to understand what we're trying to achieve. And, uh, and I probably read it 10 times. So <laughs> that's probably the, the book. It's not a, a business book in the sense that there's tons of formulas and frameworks and stuff like that, but they are, it's more about. Well, technically it helps you, your business it, as well. Exactly. It gives you guts feeling. And I think it, it gave me a little bit of a, of a perspective and an understanding of what a luxury brand is or should be or how people perceive it. And, and this helps take, this, take decision on a daily basis. Uh, number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? I mean, I was thinking about it when I, when I saw your question and I was, you know, there's, there's no specific, I'm not somebody who has like, I'm, I'm not a fan of, you know, even if we, I look at sport or things like this, I never had like, you know, pictures of, of people like, like, like an like idol or super fan, yeah, yeah. but I like to, to look at everybody and try to, to, to study and understand what, what they do in any industry. I like tech industry and, then, you know, I mean, of course, a classic would be, you know, I like what Steve Jobs is, but I like his vision. I don't like his management style. And it could be the opposite with many other. And um, I think in general, I, I try to be very open minded and get inspired to as many people as possible and not one specific, because I think your journey is going to be def different from anybody else. So you can learn from everybody, but very different things. And you can learn from what people do well as much as what people didn't do well. And right. uh, that's why if you only look at the successful people, that's not going to work because you're going to be successful by failing and you need to learn from those who failed. And right. I felt when I did my MBA, we had a lot of, you know, um, like uh, leadership uh, seminars and stuff like that. And they bring these big guys who, who were success, successful. Yeah. And I got frustrated every time because they only talk about their success. And I think we need yeah. to look at the failures. That's where we learn the most. So no one specific in mind at the moment. No one specific, but again, any industry. And you know, my father was a CEO, and he's probably the one, I, the one person I refer the most. That works. That counts. Uh, number three. Uh, what would you say is your favorite online tool for? Uh, I'm not going to say building, but that assists you on a regular basis in your working day. Uh, to be honest, it's, uh, I think we are a very virtual team. Uh, we, have, we don't have our own boutique, but we have an army of salespeople around the world. And I think uh, WhatsApp is the most basic, but the most efficient yeah. tool for us today. And what we, we create specific content that every time we launch a product or we have something to communicate, we have groups, we have subgroups, we have sub-subgroups, and we, when we, we send the information. And I think a lot of brands try to go into too, I mean, try to make things too complex for us. Simple things work the best. Absolutely. I so we have, for example, simple images of our product with like three or four legends it's explaining these are the key features. These are the key elements you need to explain to your customer. And that's it. And we send that and people are super happy. They can even share it with the, the, their customer. And everybody oh, is very easy. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Great. Number four, if you could uh, give your 20 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think I would tell the, my 20 year old self would be, well, believe in yourself and don't take anything personal. Um, I think in, in, in many cases, especially for me in the beginning, it was hard to get criticism. And at the end of the day, as I said before, you learn from a lot of, of those things. And what I noticed with Moser is the more we get criticized, we, the more we polarize, the more we sell watches. So it, it changed in the last five, six, seven years where the beginning, every time we would implement something new, like the very rare, everybody was like, that's the most stupid claim ever. Well, today it works for us. And we believed in it. We, we get as much criticism. People now understand why we are very rare. When we did our videos or our claims about how we perceive connected watches or the Swiss made, and we created the crazy watch with, with cheese on it, a lot of people said, this is terrible. This is the worst thing ever. But so many people know Moser by then. And maybe they forgot the cheese watch. Or maybe they only think Moser is about the cheese watch. But at the end of the day, we got out there. We expressed our vision, our values. And that helped us grow. And that's the, the biggest success that uh, we, can, we can see from that. So we can take it, all those criticisms personally. 
it hurts. If you think it has, this is something that brings and add value to your brand, then you, you, you're growing with that. And the final question, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I want to include naps in there. Uh, there's no naps in Switzerland, <laughs> but uh, I try to get as much as possible. So um, if I can get between seven and eight, that's, uh, that's what I need. We tried for a few years to go below that, but eventually I, this won't work. Doesn't work. Some of my kids need less than that. They're lucky I can. <laughs> How many kids do you have, by the way? I have four. Four kids. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, Edward, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. I know... Uh, pleasure. Thank you for your time, also. Absolutely. I mean, I look forward to maybe catching up with you in a year from now to see how things have changed, hopefully for the better. Definitely. We'll be there. Great. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. And you too. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment, information, and educational programming on the internet. Audible sells digital audiobooks, radio and TV programs, and audio versions of magazines and newspapers. To start using Audible today, please visit their website at www.audible.com. That's www.audible.com.